welcome to the 2020 Ohio Anna Book Festival. I'm Jody Casella and pleased to welcome you to the infinite variety writing and illustrating in all its forms, a conversation with some of the most varied and dynamic writers and illustrators of books for young people. This panel is brought to you by Paragraphs Bookstore in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Um, the bookstore boasts amazing authors who write for young adults and middle grade readers. Paragraphs is proud to play this small part in the special outreach program for the 2020 Ohio Anna Book Festival. Before we get started, I want to thank the Ohio Anna Book Festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed on the Ohio Anna website. And now I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Doug Coates, Carrie Logan Hollihan, Tani McGregor, Brandon Marie Miller, and Dave Zelay. Um, so I was going to say a few things about each writer, and then I'm going to have them talk a little bit about the book that's featured at our festival this year. So Doug Coates, his book is Riley's Winning Catch. He's drawing on his experiences as a coach. He writes books about good character and sportsmanship, nestled in stories about baseball and girls softball. Besides writing, he enjoys watching collegiate and pro football and Major League Baseball. The author loves researching ancestry and family histories. He has currently five grandkids, enjoys beach vacations, classic autos, and spending time with his partner, Karen. Carrie Logan Hollihan is the author of Creepy and True, Mummies Exposed. Carrie's the author of numerous award-winning nonfiction books for young people. She enjoys the challenge of putting the past into context for today's wired youngsters. Kids don't get enough credit for being able to understand history as it actually happened, she says. As I write, I explain the whys of situations as well as the what's. Tani McGregor, her book is Ink and Ideas, Sketch Notes for Engagement, Comprehension, and Thinking. Tani is an internationally known teacher and conference speaker. She served as a literacy coach, gifted intervention specialist, and pre-K-12 staff developer. In addition to writing and consulting, Tani serves as a teacher on special assignment for West Claremont Schools in Cincinnati. She and her husband, Miles, have four daughters and four grandsons. Brandon Marie Miller, her book is Robert E. Lee, The Man, The Soldier, The Myth. She's the author of numerous award-winning books for young people. When she's not researching and writing, she loves to read biographies and murder mysteries, attend the ballet, and watch sports and old movies from the 1930s and 40s. She lives in Cincinnati. And fun fact, she includes her middle name on all of her books so people know she is a girl named Brandon. <laughs> and last but not least, Dave Zelay. His book is The Superlative. A. Lincoln, poems about our 16th president. He's an award-winning an award-winning illustrator, working author, and college professor. Dave, his wife, and three cats live along a stream that runs through the nearby Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Ohio. They have two adult sons and a granddaughter. Well, welcome everybody here today. Um, I thought it would be best if we went around and I hope, Doug, you don't mind being the first person to say a little bit about your book that's featured today. And, um, and I know you have another book out this year, too. So if you want to say a little bit about those books. Um, so thank you. Here's Doug Coates. Sure. Thank you. Um, first, I think it was either Carrie or Brandon that was asking what we all had in common. And I just found one item. Uh, Tanny, two of my three children graduated from the old West Claremont known as Glen Esty. Yay. Oh yeah, we got that in common. Um, thank you for the opportunity. The current book, Riley's Winning Catch, Good Character Prevails, is the second in a series of um, middle grade character books. And I draw my experience really from my time as a board member of the Joe Knoxall Miracle League. Uh, anyone that's not familiar with the Miracle League organization, uh, there's over 300 in the country and it, it's a facility that provides the opportunity for children, special needs children and adults to play baseball in their own way. And it was my early association with uh, the Nuxall Miracle League and Kim Nuxall, the son of the famous Joe Nuxall that 
it began to dawn on me that there was some real story here. And as Jody mentioned, I, I coached for many years, uh, baseball and softball. And drawing upon those experiences, plus what I've uh, experienced at the Miracle League, which is totally different from coaching what I'll say normal youth teams. These kids just love to uh, have the camaraderie of other children that have special needs. There's no rules, there's no scorekeeping. And we accommodate virtually every special need that's out there. So Riley, <clears throat> Riley is a teenage girl who does everything else uh, like other teenage girls does, but she really likes softball. But she's afraid that she won't be accepted on a traditional girls team. And she knows her skills are limited. But she finds a coach that teaches character. And, and um, the one thing about um, Riley is that she has Down syndrome. So she knows she looks a little bit different, she acts a little bit different, and her skills are limited. And they're not gonna increase. But she manages to play one year for this caring coach. And along the way, she learns about the Miracle League organization. And so the following year and subsequent years, she's found a home where um, abilities are not first. It's the, um, it's the time that you spend with others. And she's with other people that have Down syndrome, others that have all kinds of uh, autism, other special needs, and there's no pressures. And so Riley um, succeeds in the normal world with youth recreation, but then she gets out on her own and she lands a, a, a team that's uh, really her comfort level. And so that's the second of two books. The first one was about a little league pitcher and his on and off field um, experiences with character. This one's softball. And it again dwells on the experiences of uh, coaching and the eight years I've been on the board and seen firsthand what this means to kids to be able to have their own special game, so. Thank you. Um, Carrie, cool. I think you're up next. Oh, hi. Yes. <laughs> hi, Jody. thank you. Yeah, this year with Mummies Exposed, which is the first book in the series that Abrams has now, Abrams Book for Young Readers, has now uh, renamed as the Creepy and True series. Um, I came to Abrams uh, with this idea about writing a book about mummies and also another book about murder and mayhem that a previous publisher had asked me, a previous editor had asked me to uh, prepare for. And then she went to her publisher and the publisher said no twice. So we went to Abrams with these, these two ideas and um, I very fortunately attracted the interest of their uh, uh, editor at large, Howard Reeves, who uh, said, let's work first on this book called Mummies Exposed. So I did that and it was published a year ago in May, which is a heck of a time to have a mummy book come out, but in fact it did. And then um, it won a measure of success um, last year, I would say. And in the course of that, as I was preparing this, um, the uh, people at Abrams said, well, we could start this to be a series and we could call this the Creepy and True series. And I'm like, Okay, that's fine. So they, so I figured we'd do this murder and mayhem book next, and and they're saying, what the next book we want is a ghost book, and I'm going ghosts are creepy, but are ghosts true? So actually, that book is coming out next month in September. So I do have another book coming along in the creepy and true series, which is totally um totally aside from true mummies, but I had to actually dig up ghost stories that are coming true as well. So that's what's happening. And now I'm finishing up a book on bones. And, I, and then it's gonna be more like an archeology span thing. I did want, want to reach out to Dave and say, Dave, um, I do have in my ghost book, The Ghost of Abraham Lincoln. So uh -huh. if you ever wanna to get together, we can talk about that. <laughs> And Tanny, as far as one thing is what, what you do that I was thinking about today in terms of what do we all do? Well, obviously, we all love kid lit, but as I put my two kids through school washing up and just watched families all around me, both relatives and neighbors and things, I've come to really have a concern for how kids who don't learn traditionally, and this would also be a point to you, Doug, uh, what they can do. And one of the things that struck me that I wish we'd had when I was a kid was visual type note-taking, visual learning, and so I'm eager to hear what you say about that. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Tammy, um, you're next, and so this is a nice little segue because you write books for teachers to use in the classroom, right? Is mm -hmm. that 
correct? That's okay. right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my publisher is Heinemann Publishing, and and most of the books Heinemann publishes are for professional learning purposes for teachers. But what's interesting with this book, and this is my book, Ink and Ideas, um, is um, that it's and and maybe just because of our current circumstances within the past six nine months. Um, a lot of parents and students have become interested in it as well, um, just because um, I think we're looking for as many different ways that are maybe not the conventional ways to show our invisible thinking and make it shareable and um, just sort of um, help us to make some kind of visual record of, of our thinking. And so, um, Really, my book, if somebody asks me how long it took me to write it, I would probably say 50 or more years, because I've always been the kind of person who wants to have a pen in my hand. And my mom tells me that when I was a kid, I, she never could keep like eyeliner in her purse or in her makeup bag because I'd be drawing with it somewhere. Um, but at the beginning of my book, I really pay tribute to my grandpa. My family's from Somerset, Kentucky, and um, my grandpa was a tobacco farmer. And I watched him when I was growing up, every time he would read or write, and he had a fifth grade education uh, before he stopped going to school and working in the fields, um, I would always notice my grandpa would have a pen in his hand when he was reading or listening to something. And he would highly annotate the newspaper, for example, or the Bible when he read it in the morning or anything he could get his hands on. And I always found that fascinating because for me, the only time I really ever took traditional kinds of notes, it would be only if a teacher assigned it or if I was studying for an exam or something like that. So um, I guess that was really the seed idea for this book. And then um, this is, I'm starting my 32nd year as a teacher and I've just noticed that um, kids have so many ways to express themselves, but not all of them are sometimes considered viable by teachers and by our systems. And so I'm all about like exposing teachers and kids to other ways um, that they can make their thinking visible and get it out there in the world. So my book's really just about how anytime you're reading or listening to something or, or even thinking about something, there are lots of ways that you can capture your thinking besides just an indented paragraph with capitalization and punctuation mm -hmm. and really just sort of merging um, the two worlds of words and pictures together. Thanks. Oh, very cool. Um, okay, Brandon, Marie Miller. <laughs> My new book this year, well, came out last year, is Robert E. Lee, The Man, The Soldier, The Myth. And um, I, I never knew that this book would be so timely as it is, since Lee is often in the news now with Confederate statues. And um, it took me three or four years to really research and write this book. And it deals with Lee's entire life, from his scandal-ridden childhood to his excellence as a cadet at West Point, his 35 years in the United States military, his family, his wife and children. And um, then, of course, there's some time spent on the Civil War, why he made the decision that he did. I talk a lot about Lee and slavery because a lot of people today still believe that Lee did not own slaves and that he freed slaves and none of that is true. It's part of the myth of Lee. And um, in his last five years where he was president of Washington College and um, how he, he dealt with losing the war, there was a lot of bitterness, there was a lot of depression. He was truly a white supremacist and um, so it's a difficult book to write. There's about 20 pages of source notes. I want everyone to know where every quote came from. I was able to do a lot of research. There's a Lee family digital archive out of his birthplace at Stratford Hall in Virginia. And um, the book did go on. It was a National Council of the Social Studies notable children's book and a Bank Street College best book of the year. So I'm really proud of the book. I wish it could reach a larger audience. Um, it wasn't highly or widely reviewed. Um, a lot of people declined to review it, I think because it is a very controversial subject. But I always feel our country would be so much better off if we would just acknowledge our past, study our past, 
and you know really learn what happened and Lee is one of those figures today that is really a lightning rod that I think we do need to examine his life so that's my book for this year at Ohio Lana. thank you okay last but not least um Dave Zelay and I think I messed up the title of your book it's the superlative A. Lincoln poems about our 16th president I'm not sure I read that correctly before but you're the illustrator but yep. not the author, or you are the author too? Nope. No, I'm not the author. Okay. Um, Eileen Meyer is the author. Eileen is a native of Illinois. She's a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, and um, she's a poet, and she's uh, written several books. We, we are both members of SCBWI, so we have a lot of people in common um, in our network, although we haven't met face to face. We spent a lot of time together um, the, the year that we worked on this book. But we were um, matched up through Charles Bridge. So Charles Bridge acquired her uh, manuscript and then they um, were watching, apparently they saw my portfolio in New York at the, um, at the uh, SCBWI conference. And they were looking for a good uh, fit for me. And so they reached out with this book. So this was my debut book as an illustrator and it came out in November, last November 2019. Um, it is a, it was a great first project. It pretty much hit all the things that I would wish to do in, in children's book illustration. And plus I have uh, some aspirations to write and I have several manuscripts in the works. So working closely with an author and a publisher was a great experience for me to, to kind of get my feet wet and take on half of the project. And it was um, something that was in the works for a long time. I had worked in graphic design. So the advantage was that I understand the process of publishing and, and the manufacturing of books and working with an art director. I had been an art director for 25 years before I even attempted to work in the children's book market. So um, it is something that I feel um, the book, the nice thing about the book too, I was a reluctant reader when I was a child and had, had I struggled. And this book being in bite-sized poems, I think is a very good introduction to reading about history that makes it really fun for kids. And then the illustrations, of course, help illuminate um, the, the milestones that she decided to feature. So it's chronological, it starts as with Abraham Lincoln as a, a young child in Kentucky, and it goes up through um, his years of, as a teenager and then into the presidency eventually. And a um, lot, of, lot of great research and historic facts, um, some little known facts are pointed out in there. And it's, it's an easy read and it's very fulfilling. And, and like I said, for children that are reluctant leaders or, or readers or who may be reluctant to read about history, this is a great gateway for that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so I, I, this is like kind of a basic question, but I think it's a question that, that comes up when, when we're at a festival where there's an audience that usually the people in the audience will ask this question. Um, and that is why you write or illustrate for kids. And I know that, um, Tani, that you said you're writing for um, teachers, but that in this time, um, you know, more kids and parents are picking up your book. But maybe just in terms of, like, why, why your audience focus is on children to say. And, and maybe you write other things, too, and you want to bring that in, um, like, if you have other projects that are outside. But... What is it that draws you to, um, to books for kids? And um, so, do, Doug, do you mind starting again? Oh, sure, no problem. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of it, again, has to do with the subject matter that I've been working with, and that's uh, being a coach for 25 years, raising three kids, and working as a, a volunteer or board member in an environment now where there's um, also kids, special needs kids, it just um, opened the doors to say, and it was actually my former, uh, my, uh, my late editor that recommended this first book to me. She hit upon the idea one day that I had to tell Joe Nuxall's teachings 
in the way that children would like to hear it. And so I get validation when I go into the classrooms and I meet with children and, um, and in other venues and they, um, they thrive on knowledge, they thrive on facts. Um, Joe Nuxall is the youngest player to ever sign a major league contract. He was 15 years and nine months. That'll of course never happen again. But when kids hear that, they just, they start dreaming and they think, oh, wow, I could uh, skip the rest of high school and play baseball, you know, and you have to bring them back down to reality a little bit. But kids are a, a captive audience. And um, I do my presentations in a way that uh, I accentuate the good in character and sportsmanship and, and provide real life samples. And I think it hits home with them. And what they give back to me is what keeps me motivated. Um, I had a young man who I'm not actually met him, I met his grandfather. He chose to do a book report at school and um, he used kind of like a PowerPoint presentation, but he did his book report about my first book. And it was centered around a restaurant menu. So there was the appetizer and he picked things out of my outline or whatever. And then there was the, uh, the main dish and then there was the dessert, but he pulled things and the phrases that he pulled out of my book were astounding. They were more about the character teachings and they weren't so much about, yeah, the score was five to nothing. And so you got to give kids credit. And this is a nine-year-old that is pulling things out. And that's kind of what keeps me going and want to keep writing. And I'm, I'm deep in the middle of a third book already. And so uh, that's pretty much where I'm at. So. I, I want to ask a follow-up question, Doug, and that is, um, are your books they're fiction, but they have the, the sportsman-like principles in them, but these are fiction. They're stories, right? They're not, it's not nonfiction. They're not real. It's strictly fiction. The first book is um, heavily dosed in nonfiction because I bring a lot about Joe Nuxall, who was a real person, and he did do similar things, go into the classroom and uh, talk to children because he wanted to make sure that they knew about their options in life. Not everyone was gonna be talented like him and play baseball. Um, and so he taught a lot and I use myself as an example uh, in the classrooms because yes, I played ball as a kid, but I wasn't gonna to go to the major leagues. So I did the next best thing after I got married, I had kids, I started teaching baseball myself or coaching baseball. So again, the first book is principled on um, a little bit of Joe and his teachings but the rest is, is strictly fiction and baseball softball. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, Carrie, um, do you do you wanna say anything about, like I know you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of nonfiction books out. I mean, how many, I, I didn't see how many. Books. I'm working on number nine now, so okay. I'm kind of getting there, but I would have to defer to Brandon who's got many more books out than I have, but how did I get started? Well. A couple of things. Um, I was a history major as an undergraduate, and then I decided um, I went to graduate school in journalism. And um, for a long time, I did PR and did stuff like that. But I was a stay-at-home mom for many years. And um, when I was uh, starting to think about a story that I knew that I wanted to tell to children, it was about my old neighbor in Oak Park, Illinois, where I grew up, whose name was Percy LeBon Julian, a black chemist who uh, fought racism his whole life, beginning like say about 1916 or so, all the way until he died in 1975. And he was my neighbor and I was asking questions about him and uh, my dad said, said, well, he's a doctor, but he's actually a scientist. And so I looked him up, but, you know, again, my kids are out, my kids are out the door and everything. I looked him up and I found out that his house was firebombed in Oak Park in 1951, the year I was born, when he moved in. And he had a stellar but quiet career as a research chemist um, and actually synthesized cortisone from soybeans. And this made cortisone relatively inexpensive um, in the 1930s you know, in, in, in a great application. And he went on from there to devise all kinds of things using soybeans, um, dog food, um, fire foam and aircraft carriers in World War II. He became an entrepreneur and stuff. So I wrote this really great children's book, or so I thought about Dr. Julian and I sent it out and people were interested in seeing it and then I got no word with it. So I joined SCBWI, which is what many of you belong to, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a mouthful. And, there, and then I met Brandon at the first meeting I went to and um, 
Um, so we started to connect and I started to learn a little bit more about the kid lit world and how you don't write for kids the same way as write, write for adults. And um, Brandon and another, another friend, uh, Mary Kay Carson, who are both SCBWI members and nonfiction writers here in Cincinnati, um, noticed that I had an interest in Isaac Newton and they were writing for an editor at Chicago Review Press in Chicago. And they said, well, they might want a book on Isaac Newton. And so I am no physicist. I'm here to tell you, I never even studied physics in school, which is terrible to say. But, um, but so I wrote a book proposal. And one of the things I think that worked out was they liked my sample chapters. Um, my, and they also liked the fact that I could write activities because these particular books were designed as museum type books, kind of big paperbacks, kind of handbooks with a lot of content, but then also 21 kid-friendly activities. And those I knew how to write because I could needlepoint, I could garden, I could write nonfiction, I could write basically feature stories for adults, which is what I did when I went to journalism school, and all that kind of plugged in to me being able to write, and I don't want to say down, downgrade by writing, but it helped me to write short, snappy, um, assertive sentences that sing, as one professor said, mm -hmm. that could speak to kids. And so I learned how to do that. And then I did four books with Chicago Review Press for middle grade kids, and then two YA books, one on women war correspondence and one on World War I. And then I actually ended up shifting to Abrams books for young readers. And that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, you're the third person, I guess, who's mentioned SCBWI because Dave did too. And that, for the people who don't know, it's an international organization for children's book writers and illustrators. And it's really helpful for writing community, for, for writers to kind of pool resources and there's regional chapters and meetings and um, speakers and just really help you if you're trying to get into writing books for children or illustrating and trying to understand what the market is and um, just every step of the way. So it's something to look into if you're, if you're listening and you're interested in that. Um, okay, so um, Brandon, do you, do you want to add something about now? So you're, you may have the, the, the largest number of books on this panel that are out now. So what do you want? How many do you have? Um, Robert E. Lee is lucky number 13. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got started years ago when my daughters were very small. I was a stay-at-home mom, and a new history magazine for kids came out called Cobblestone. And my mother sent me a little article about it, and I majored in history in college, and she said, you should try to do this. So I thought, well, you know, I gave it a try, and I sold my first article. And that's basically how I got started. And an editor at Cobblestone passed my name along to uh, an editor at a publishing house. And they asked me to do a book proposal. And I did. And I sold that book. And, you know, that's how I started. And um, I also have been a longtime member of SCCWI. And um, it's a great resource for children's book writers. And I just, um, I always think history is the greatest story, that fact really cannot um, be outdone by fiction in terms of what people have done, you know, the bravery, the courage, the, the villains in history cannot be outdone by villains in, in fiction. And um, I want to tell those stories. I want people to know about history and its diversity. And I think, you know, those of us who write for kids, it's a privilege, and I feel a real responsibility writing history and biography to give them a much different look at someone's life than would have been written when I was a kid or even 20 or 30 years ago. Um, you know, books have changed so much, the way that they're illustrated, the way that they're researched. You know, it's, it's really a wonderful wonderful time for uh, nonfiction for kids, both in the humanities and, you know, STEM books. So it's a great time to be involved. This is a sort of follow-up to that because I heard, um, I think it was Susan Campbell Bartoletti. I don't know if you know her. She's a nonfiction mm -hmm. teacher. And she talked about how um, she was a professor at a college and they, 
she said some of the other professors in her department sometimes looked down at her a little bit because they knew she wrote for kids and they kind of had this idea maybe they had read books for kids lately or whatever and, and that it was like easier to write for kids or the research wasn't as rigorous and she was horrified by that because of course she said well she felt a greater responsibility do you want to say something about that because i know a little bit about the background when you were writing robert e lee and how much research went into that and you do you, you want to add anything to that well, that is completely true. I mean, everybody either first thinks it's easy to write a book or when are you going to write a real book for grown-ups? And they have no idea how hard it is to put across complex concepts for young people and having to do it in a much limited space with fewer words. It's terribly difficult to do that and to give context to historical times or to, you know, context of science, it, it, it's very difficult to do so that we have to understand our topic as well as we can in order to do that. And it does take just so much research and talking to experts and reading and going through documents and testing things out ourselves and um, it's a lot of work. I mean, people have no idea how much work, you know, years of work can go into a children's book. Yeah. A lot of people think they're going to they're gonna knock it off in a weekend or something. And, you know, it, it's just as hard as writing any other book. It's the same process. Yeah. Jody, if I could follow up on your question for a minute. Um, I, of course, think of things that I should have said when I was talking and it doesn't work. But the, the Riley book, while it's strictly fiction, um, it wasn't meant to be a medical book about Down syndrome or anything like that. I did a fair amount of research, but it is actually based on a person and his mannerisms and characteristics. And for those of you in Cincinnati area, Teddy Kramer is sort of the soul of this book. He's my Riley. Teddy is uh, a young man who's in his early 30s um, who has Down syndrome, but he's become an ambassador to the Miracle League. He's at a lot of our events, but he was... Um, fortunate to uh, be a bat boy for a day at the Reds uh, game several years ago. And he, his exuberance and enthusiasm just so won the Reds over that they basically hired him. And he does a lot of public relations. And so I know Teddy and his parents really well. And I sat with them uh, about a year and a half ago in their living room. And I just got all this information. And so Riley is a lot like Teddy in the manner mannerisms. And so I didn't make up anything about Riley, but that's the nonfiction part of the book, I guess, if you will. So. Yeah, I think any author has to do research if you're doing, you know, fiction, but it's always based on facts or right. you're doing illustrations. Right. I and mean, you had to learn about Abraham Lincoln to do those illustrations of him and put in those little details that kids would find interesting. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is based on some sort of research. Right. So. I would I would say on that too, when I do research, well, you can sit, and do, if you like doing research, you can sit and do it all day for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then at some point you go, okay, now I really have to sit and write this book. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that would speak to all of our experiences, if I'm not mistaken, right? You know, and, but now in finishing up for kids, I'm saying, well, what you see here is like an iceberg. You're getting about 10% of everything I learned in order to write this book for you. So. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, Dave, do you want to yeah. say something about from an illustrator point of view? Because you said this was your first book. Debut book, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll say two things. A couple things came into mind. I'm going to try to do this quickly because I think my the seeds were planted 50 years ago. I was in third grade or so, and my librarian was so important to me. Somebody who was I was struggling to read, and um, I didn't know why I wasn't identified with any particular. Uh, challenge, but I just was a visual kid, and um, I responded to pictures better than words for a long time. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in this late 60s and 70s when um, Disney was um, kind of in a heyday, and storytelling was really important to me. Um, I was very interested in animation. Um, when children's books followed animation, Peter Pan, uh, Winnie the Pooh, 
Snow White, all those things that were in an animated form. Um, then, then there was a book that uh, came before that typically. Uh, the movie might have given me initial interest and then I'd go back to the book and it, it, was, it was sort of a, a springboard. Um, so my teacher, I remember it, in the librarian introducing us to Maurice Sendak and Dr. Seuss and those early readers and those things, I'd take them home and um, go through the pictures and not, not really follow word for word. But um, as, I was, as I was growing, I still challenged as a reader. I remember in fifth grade, my uh, a great teacher who just really had, he, he, he knew who I was and he was reading um, Tom Sawyer to us. And he'd read a little bit each day in class and he noticed that I was, I was doodling a lot. Um, that's the way I could take my, you know, program my brain to listen to a lecture in essence. And it, it really is a lot like what Tani does with her books. Um, so he, he pulled me aside and I thought I was in trouble for doodling during the, the lesson. And he um, took me down the hall and connected me with the art teacher and said, I, would, I want Dave to work on this mural in the art room instead of sitting in class because he obviously, there's something inside of him. So he, um, yeah, they, they let me work on a, uh, it was a mural that celebrated the sesquicentennial of Akron. So it had the rubber history, it had the canal history. So it was a history lesson that was um, engaging me through art. And that was, a, that was like one of those, those seeds that were planted. So fast forward, I, I kind of abandoned artwork and reading for the most part through the rest of my years through school. And um, when I graduated from high school, I didn't know what to major in and somebody was working in advertising. So I ended up in advertising for most of my adult life. I, I spent a lot of time doing advertising. Um, fast forward a little bit more after an advertising career, I ended up um, getting my master's degree in communications first. And I was in a class in London, England, in Bloomsbury, actually. And it was a two week class for international public relations. And my wife came with me. And so we go to, we do field trips during the day and we talk to PR agents at uh, various places. And on our downtime, she and I, Krista and I went to used bookstores and we were collecting children's books. We had been doing that for a while. And uh, we started realizing that in that little town, Bloomsbury, um, J.M. Barry lived there, uh, Charles Dickens lived there. We were getting this like sort of weird connection to literature and children's books in particular because we were looking for Roald Dahl books and things like that. And uh, we had this long discussion. So after these two weeks of very intensive learning on the way back, I was already a professor by the way, um, but I wasn't tenured and I was teaching design and we were on this long flight back and she, you know, we were just talking about how meaningful that was and how it was a turning point and how it connected me to my childhood. And we started drafting up the first children's book idea about a little fox that gets lost in London. And that was in 2008. And I put it on the back burner and I went through this academic process of getting tenured, which I also struggled with. I wasn't an illustrator per se at the time, but when my interest um, in children's books became part of my work uh, career, that's when I had trouble proving that that was rigorous enough to get tenured with. That's where my research was. So I had that same struggle in, in the academic world. Um, finally, until I started winning awards and getting recognition and actually getting published and getting agented, um, they st it turned the corner. And so um, the children's book thing for me, it, it sort of came in through the back door. I wasn't planning it. I didn't, I didn't think that that was going to be my career path. Now it's what I teach at the university. I'm a full professor, tenured full professor. Um, I am the, the illustration person at the School of Art. And um, again, I'm an aspiring author as well. So I have lots of books in the works and it's pretty much come full circle
And I think I started becoming a children's book writer in third grade, honestly. <laughs> well, this makes me think of Tammy too, because of um, what you said, Dave, about how you were drawing as you were listening and and I think I skipped you before, Tammy, but I didn't mean to. Um, so do you want to say something about, like, I know you're not writing for kids, but your interest obviously is in children learning. So, um, And I, I think, I mean, this, just this listening to you all has helped me realize that I am writing for kids, yeah. ultimately, yeah. just through teachers who will helpfully touch so many kids um, across years. But I, so many connections or threads abound in this conversation for me. Um, just like Dave, your whole experience, it makes me think about like, I think I be, sort of became a writer in kindergarten and thanks to Mrs. Hindle, like I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for her. So probably 1970, I would say, um, she had us writing books. So here's the first book I ever wrote. And moms used to come into elementary schools and cover books with wallpaper and, you know, <laughs> back in the day, somebody spent time typing this book on a typewriter. But I wrote the book about the littlest elephant and, um, you know, it's about four or five pages long. And some of you will remember the Young Authors Conference. So she nominated me for the Young Authors Conference. So at five years old, I'm standing in front of a microphone in a gymnasium reading my story. And she told me I was an author. <laughs> so, um, and I could get choked up, but I won't. <laughs> um, so like, I want to provide that for, for kids and help teachers and parents realize the brilliance um, that every single one of our children has inside them. And so when we're limiting kids to just a, a conventional way to respond to text, or um, thinking about reading and writing as, God forbid, the way for us to prepare for tests. Um, that's missing the whole point and um, will sadly miss the brilliance of so many along the way, if that's the path we take. Um, so I, I, I connect so um, strongly with Doug with what he said about how kids crave information. Like they wanna know. Um, and so, in my book, I really tried to help teachers realize that kids deserve to know the research behind all of this. They need to know that when you're doodling, it's not just doodling, it's not fluff. It's a way, it's an intuitive way to process that invisible, abstract, sometimes complex, you know, thinking that you have to simplify it and organize it on the page in some way. Um, and so there's so much research out there about what thinking with pen in hand can do or stylus on a screen for that matter, um, helping you concentrate, focus more deeply, keep you from daydreaming. Uh, the list goes on and on and you don't have to be an artist to do all those things. An artist as we so you know, commonly define it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I, I just want teachers and kids to realize that people through the ages, brilliant thinkers through the ages, have um, shown us their thinking in notebooks. And that's really where the start of all my books come from. This is my fourth book that I've authored or co-authored. All of them ultimately are about kids and their thinking. Um, my first book was about how a lot of kids will read and not realize that reading is thinking, <laughs> that it's not just the surface strategies that you're using in decoding text, but it's your thinking mixed in that brings that page to life. Um, so anyway, I want kids to know that, you know, every, everyone who was a notebooker or a visual thinker from Leonardo da Vinci, whose notebooks came to the Cincinnati um, Union Terminal um, Museum a few years back, and I saw them under the dome of plastic or glass, and I just got chills because I saw how his words and pictures and doodles and, you know, for him, backwards writing and all kinds of other things um, encapsulated this thinking that lasted and has stood the test of time. And then fast forward lots of years to Jane Goodall, who's also a notebooker, who has um, left us with and continues to leave us with, thankfully, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of color-coded thinking, of messy thinking sometimes, and it doesn't look anything like sometimes what in school writing looks like. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I just want to, uh, the, the title for this panel could not be better. So whomever came up with that, thank you. Just that whole idea of infinite variety um, and just letting go of all of the rules and limits that bind us um, inside of school as educators and every person on this panel has 
has like lived this out in their careers, um, respecting kids and letting, you know, teachers and kids know that your thinking can take you anywhere. So I, I should have said this at the very beginning, but I'm deeply honored to be part of this panel with all of you. May I ask a question about Tani, please? Just from my own curiosity, Tani. Uh, actually, two questions. Would you have, I went through your website to, um, and number one is, do you have a book that you might specifically direct to parents with children who are elementary to junior high, like K through eight, um, that would help children along with their teachers to boost their, um, their appreciation, their understanding, their enjoyment of the learning process. That would be my first one. And my second question is your, your concept of journal a la Jane Goodall. Um, do you have a book for adults that might help adults even uh, who perhaps are not great readers or um, are possibly um, disorganized thinkers or something like that? Um, to kind of be able to extract their work days or to take their work days or their work lives in, or their entire lives to kind of notebook those as well. I have several things that come to mind. Um, first of all, I, I would say like my, my first book, Comprehension Connections, is really an exploration of six or seven strategies that anyone can use of any age. I directed it towards like maybe a kindergarten through eighth grade audience, but the strategies that all of us use to make meaning. And if we think about that, like what strategies do you use when you're playing, learning to play a musical instrument or learning to play a sport, Doug, or mm -hmm. driving a car, um, all of those same strategies we can apply when we're making meaning when we're reading, like accessing your background knowledge and asking great questions along the way and determining what's important. So that would be one book that I would um, say that I've been part of writing that would um, ultimately, it's, it's all about developing a lifelong love of learning and reading, no matter what age we are. Um, but I think it's, it's more a, a metacognitive approach of like realizing what it is you do as a meaning maker. And then appreciating that, being able to like notice and name that and articulate that for others um, can really help you grow as a thinker and a reader. And then there are two books that I thought of with, um, on the, the notebooking or visual note taking side. One is written by an Ohio author and she might have been an Ohio, uh, a, a prior Ohioana author, featured author, and that's Jessica Fries Gaither. She teaches um, science at the Columbus School for Girls, and she has a picture, children's picture book that was published by um, NS, uh, the National NSCD, I think I have that right, um, the science organization, and the imprint is NSCD Kids, um, but it's called Notable Notebooks, and she was sort of frustrated as a teacher. She couldn't find a book to um, show her own students how brilliant scientists down through time. And I keep using the word brilliant, sorry, overuse. Mm -hmm. I'll admit it. It's the only word that comes to mind right now. Um, but the, her book shows, and it even features some of her Columbus, Ohio students work at the end, how scientists across time um, have sort of doodled and drawn their way through their careers and um, have left this like lasting um, artifact for us to appreciate and learn from. So that would be a, a book, a children's book that really is for all ages. It's written in rhyming couplets, so it's super easy to share with primary kids, but I learned from it myself. Um, and then the book that I think of that um, might be more, that is more written for adults, but gets the message across that doodling and drawing and um, visual note taking can be an important part of smart people's lives would be presidential doodles. Yeah. And I want to say the author is David Greenberg. Um, we'll have to look that up, but um, presidential doodles for sure. It takes us through little vignettes, um, little stories from George Washington all the way up through, I want to say George W. Bush, showing how like in high stakes meetings or under in times of pressure that our US presidents have picked up paper and pen to help doodle and draw to process uh, their own thinking in times of trouble. And I think that maybe is one of the biggest benefits that I hope teachers and kids come away with from my work is that 
um, above all of the benefits that we could cite with comprehension and focus and memory, um, we have studies to show us that we can actually help to regulate our anxiety <laughs> and even calm us down. And if there's ever been a time we needed that, it might be now. Mm -hmm. um, to actually just sort of tune out the noise in our heads and focus on good thinking. And so that book, Presidential Doodles, I found it to be highly amusing and informative too. Thanks. You know, Catherine just gave me a, um, like a heads up that we're running out of time. But I, on your, what you just said, Tani, made me think, um, I asked another panel what they were doing during this time of um, COVID, because it's such a, obviously here we are in a virtual panel instead of mm -hmm. at the actual festival and how we've had to adapt and, and just, I mean, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about this too as a writer, like how, what is creativity for writers and artists now during this time? Like some people seem to be more productive and some people seem to be having trouble or like different outlets that you have for, for trying to stay creative. And so I don't know, we only have a few minutes left, but maybe if we could just go around, if you have any thoughts about like how to, how to be creative during this time, or maybe how you're adapting. Um, uh, Doug, do you want to start again? Well, yeah, quickly, um, it is a strange time, and um, it's frustrated me with the new book. And so um, I spend a lot of time just trying to come up with creative ideas, and so uh, marketing ideas. So I reach out to a number of people with proposals or thoughts and, uh, and just try and get the, the, the book out in any format I can. And I also take solace in the fact that this will end and everything will get back to where we can get out into the bookstores and so forth. And then I also realized too that, okay, I can't market the way I want to. I, I need to continue writing because it's important to write virtually every day. So I just have to keep a, a positive outlook. Yeah. Carrie? Well, I tell my friends when I start to complain that I'm really tired about writing about dead people. Oh. And I don't mean just dead people, like, I, every, I, mean, I always write about people who are dead, but really dead people. So um, so when I come up for air, fortunately, it's summertime, and I go out and work in my yard and pull weeds, and that's very therapeutic. Um, I try to read mysteries. I share time with my writing buddies like Brandon and some other people. We just kind of all commiserate and kind of move on. And we're all kind of a, at a certain age, too. Fortunately, you know, we have kind of seen some of this in our lives, certainly not a pandemic, but I'm always drawn back to my, my parents and my grandparents who lived through the, the Great Depression and World War II, and what was that about? I think about my own life and, you know, trying to think, well, what's important to communicate to the next generation? So I'm kind of working on that, and what else to do? Oh, I love to watch PBS, I, and I like to watch, like, Masterpiece Mystery right now, so that's what I'm doing. So, yeah. Um, Tammy? Um, one correction to something I said, I think the acronym I used for the publisher of Jessica Fries Gaither's Notable Notebooks, I think I mixed that up. It's NSTA, National Science Teachers Association. So sorry about that. Um, I'm one of those people who has had trouble reading uh, or, or reading at the pace that I usually keep um, since March. So I have read, you know, I've, I've kept up my reading life, but not at the not at the pace that I could before. So I have more turned to drawing and creating during this time. Um, and one thing, you can see this on my website. I'll just hold up one of them. I, I, maybe if you can see it on my phone. I've started making visual calendars. <laughs> so just keeping track of like the weather and where we took a walk because that's like our entertainment right now is going for a walk someplace. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting that uh, you know, I consider myself a, a big reader, um, but for the past few months, it's it's been hard for me to focus as much, but I can focus still with, with a pen in my hand, so. I like that. Um, Brandon? Um, I have not really been writing, but I've been able to read more, and I've been working a lot of puzzles, and uh, we got Brit Fox, and we've been watching a lot of uh, English dramas and old uh, mysteries. And um, lately, just recently, we've been able to get our masks on and we've gone to the Cincinnati Museum Center and the Art Museum. And it's been so nice to just go and just see some art and just, you know, 
big thing that other people have created. And I just wanted to say one thing to what Tammy was saying before. Whenever I'm really revising a manuscript, I have to print it off and sit down with a stack of sharp pencils and a big eraser. And I have to have that brain to, to hand connection to really revise a book. And um, kids are always shocked when they see how messy a, re a revised page is. And I'm like, you know, this is art. If you paint or you draw or you throw a piece of pottery, it's messy. And writing is the same thing. It's all creative. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I hope everybody's, you know, doing okay through all of this. <laughs> Dave, you're going to be our, our final person. I, so make it good. No pressure. Well, no, I, you know, um, I worked for, uh, I taught for 14 years um, to build up to this year long sabbatical that was supposed to be all about this anyway, before the pandemic. So I had a lot of pressure on me and I found that that pressure was not a good thing. Um, it kind of locks you up. It's kind of like, you know, being on a game show. Okay, you've got a blank piece of paper. Now you need to fill it, which is absolutely the wrong way to approach creativity. Um, I, we had plans to travel and to look for inspiration and to just, um, you know, get out and do some free thinking. So I was forced to do a little, I did a little bit of that last fall, but then by the time the winter hit, and we were locked up in the spring, um, I was cut short. So I always, I, the good thing is that having been a college professor for these years, I've, I have a lot of creative students that need tools to come up with ideas. And so we do lots of mind mapping and free thinking and word clouds and things. And it is a form of doodling and it's just getting the brain moving. And I think that works with writing too, write a sentence a day, write a sentence a week, whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to approach my uh, writer and art block the way that I would uh, do that for students. And I, so I've been practicing that. I'm not where I wanted to be right now with my writing and, and some of the art, but I, realize that it's coming and it's and it's a little bit slow right now because I, I think we're all distracted and mm -hmm. emotions are high and and <clears throat> now I'm starting to teach virtually tomorrow actually for the first time mm -hmm. a full teaching load and it's all going to be online which I'm not trained to do mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of pressure but I think um, to you know you got to look for your muse and you've got to use some tools sometimes I, I have to get outside and get some fresh air and take a walk and move around in order for me to have creative ideas. And then I can bring that back and process, process that on paper or through typing. Um, but I need, you, you have to change the scenery. You can't just stare at it and wait for it to happen, you know? Yeah, that's, that's great, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, thanks again to our panelists, Doug Coates, Carrie Logan Hollihan, Tani McGregor, Brandi Marie Miller, and Dave Soleil. Thank you also again to all of our festival sponsors and partners, including Paragraphs Bookstore. And thank you for joining us. Please check out the Ohio Anna website for all of this year's festival programming. Thank you, Jody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, everybody. Really fun.